treasurer's report, uh, as I always repeat, uh, we, we, when we met in person, we used to have treasurer's reports available. Um, but, um, and by the way, Jim, it says you're recording the meeting. So I don't know if you meant to, but it's fine. Um, anyway, if you wish to have a, a copy sent to you, you can email our treasurer uh, at the address that we list in our website and she will be happy to mail you a copy of the treasurer report the board always meets prior to this meeting and, and accepts the report. And that was done again today. Um, also, I want to just remind people that uh, the board meetings are open to the membership uh, to participate if you want. Then the way to do that is to, before, before the meeting, is to email our secretary, Brad Jacobson, and he will um, email you back a copy of the link if you wish to participate. Uh, we had, didn't have anybody today last month. We did have one person that participated uh, that just uh, listened to what the board is doing. And of course the board minutes are posted in our in our uh, website. So you're, you're welcome to cha channel those and uh, appreciate that. Okay. Uh, with that being said, I don't think Greg is with us today. Are you Greg? I don't think Greg Rodemaker is, uh, I, I know he was planning to be here, but I don't help him. If, if he joins later, we welcome him. At this point, I would like to ask our service director of membership services, Cynthia Queen, to give us a report on service. Cynthia? Hi, Dick. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. And I'm glad to hear that so many of you have received your COVID vaccines. I look forward to the day when the staff and uh, myself can get ours. We are um, still using all our best precautions here and still have some uh, you know, instances that occur in our office building, but uh, everybody's hanging in there. So I'm really glad that you're all doing well. I had just a couple things I wanted to share today. And um, I did wanna just add Dick that you were asking about our CEO, Greg Rodemaker. He um, is getting ready to join the meeting um, this week is the Calipers um, General Assembly for the heads of all the pension systems in the state. And he's been participating in that. He's gonna be joining us very shortly. This week will be our March SDSERS board meeting. And two big things that are happening this week include the valuation presentation by our actuary Chiron. We, have the, we always have the initial presentation in January and the final presentation and acceptance in March. And as you all know, the big deal with the actuarial presentation is this determines how much each of the three plan sponsors will pay in their annual bill due on July 1st. And that's always big news for the newspapers and for everyone. And we certainly work with them all the way up in, in preparing for that. And then additionally, we have uh, recently held three elections among the active members for the two general member seats and the active fire seat. And those results will be announced and confirmed at Friday's meeting. So we're looking forward to that. That we'll have some new faces on the board and we certainly have our trainings all prepared and we'll be thanking those whose service has ended. And then I wanted to add that I did see a question that showed up in the chat and I feel like it would be worthwhile for everyone to share. The question was asking if you are registered on SDSERS member, po member portal, which I hope that you are and encourage you to do. If for some reason you change your email, which people do, sometimes even the active members are using your work email. When you change emails, you will need to re-register. And let me explain why. We made a decision when we created the member portal as one of our security features that we would have the user ID be the email address. And with that, if a person does change email, you simply need to re-register, which should only take a few minutes and our call center would be glad to help you with that. So if anyone does have any questions, please just call our main number at 619. 525-3600 and we'd be glad to assist you. And I hope that that does answer that question on the email or excuse me, on our member portal. As you all know, on your member portal, that's where you can see your um, monthly pension statements and you can also get additional copies of your 1099s and change um, your address or beneficiary updates and find a lot of good information there. So I encourage you to use it. That's all I have to share today, unless anybody has any questions. Cynthia, our speaker hasn't arrived yet, so. Yes, she has. Couple. Oh, she is, great, okay. I'm looking Excellent. forward to it. <laughs> Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so that being said, I'd like to have uh, board member Chris Brewster introduce our 
speaker for today. I'd like to adjourn our business meeting and turn it over to Chris for our speaker. Chris? Yeah, hi, Dick. I, I don't actually think, I think her secretary has just set this up for her for the moment. Um, and I think she's anticipating 11.15. All right. Um, will you let us know? And I mean, I'm going to kick it back to Cynthia to see if she can fill a little bit here. She's good at that. And uh, uh, Chris, give, give us a wave when uh, our speaker is ready to go, okay? Will do. All right. What else you got for us? And I know that I am supposed to keep my stand-up comedy routine clean, so I'm going to stick with business because I haven't rehearsed the clean version of my late night comedy. What I want to share with you is that um, I think you all know that our office is still closed to the public and that as many places are, although things are reopening, thank goodness, I dream of the day when I will go to a concert again. But for now, um, SD Serves is still located in the same office building downtown, and um, most of the place is fairly empty. Um, the way we have kept our business going is that we have a core staff here. We always have a leadership team member and a call center staff member, as well as the folks who process the health and the disability documents, which require us to be in person. And so on average, there's maybe four to seven people here. We rotate it. We have very strict rules to keep everyone safe. And I've been pleased with, with how we've all gotten through this. You know, at the beginning, it was kind of hard for people to figure out how to get here. But we certainly get our deliveries every day and via email and the, the call center phones and um, re regular mail and everything. And so we are able to keep up with that on a daily basis. We still scan every incoming document into our electronic imaging system and keep a record of every contact we have with everyone who contacts us. So I'm very pleased with the technology that was put in place uh, before the good old pandemic hit. Um, as you know, there are still challenges to technology. So <laughs> sometimes there's trouble with emails and other things, but you know we have a great team here that works on it and um, everybody's always paying really close attention. And the thing I'm thankful for is that because we have a very close relationship with our members, um, in fact, that I know most of you personally and that we have regular contact with folks, we certainly know if something has been missing um, because of that daily contact that we have with everyone. So I'm so pleased that we've been able to um, you know, take care of our members. We have still processed disability applications. We have still paid payroll every month absolutely on time. And I believe that we're doing a good job of answering our members' questions. We still receive around 100 phone calls a day and um, at least 75 to 100 uh, requests through the website. Um, members can send those via the member portal and through the general website. So um, the call center team that long ago was only answering calls, they are regularly responding to questions via email, which has worked very well. And when members who, are, who have not yet retired, when they go to retire, they apply um, to, to retire online is the first step. They complete the beginning part of that application online. And then as soon as that is submitted, they get a phone call to schedule their personal counseling appointment, which is held over the phone. Can't believe we've been doing that for coming up on a year now. I clearly remember it was March 20th was the day that we all went home. And so I'm kind of amazed at how it's, how it's been for that whole year. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about how you're getting ready to plan to do your REA meetings um, you know, with the virtual and in-person component as you move forward. I'm sure a number of you through either clubs that you participate in or, or churches or other organizations are, are seeing how that is working. I even went to a social event the other night where many of us were on, a, on Zoom and then a couple of people were live and we were, it was so interesting to have conversations with a person who's sitting there, you know, distanced from another person and yet I'm in my bedroom. So I, I, I very much agree with what Jim is saying that I think this will continue to expand your membership. I believe that you've continued to see the REA membership grow during and even having people attend from remote. We do still um, inform every retiree of your membership and share the membership information with them to ensure that they have an opportunity to join REA. And then as we come up on our open enrollment in June, there will be the mailing with the complete booklet and all that information and with the REA and Retiree Association information inviting members to join. So it's been interesting to see the, uh, the increases in the membership and attendance. I do think that having the virtual option really does help people who either 
just don't want to drive that far um, or who do live out of state, which we've got a good number of those folks. Or if you're not really feeling well that day and don't want to share your germs, you can still participate in the meeting um, from remote as long as you don't look too bad on camera, turn off your camera or sneeze on camera. So there's still etiquette. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you welcoming me here. It's always nice to see you all. I hope I did okay. You did great, Cynthia, as you always do. Um, let me add a couple of things. Um, we, we have, the board is beginning to look down the road towards having in-person meetings. It still will be a while, but I think before I think we're, we feel really safe, Got to need to get a lot more of us vaccinated and city needs to decide to open its facilities, which it hasn't done yet. But we are thinking ahead. And uh, as uh, Cynthia just mentioned, um, we're going to start thinking about how we can use some technology to combine both the virtual with the in-person. Uh, we're just kicking off discussion of that today. So, it'll, you know, we'll have to see what it would take, what it would cost, whether we can afford it and so forth. But I, does, I do think it will um, help us maintain it. Secondly, I'd like to remind people that, as Cynthia said, um, the open enrollment for health insurance is going to start on June 1st, but run through the end of the month. And SERS has always been great to include our recruitment package, which includes a flyer uh, application for our EA, as well as the pension deduction authorization form. We'll be doing that again. That has historically been the time when REA has gotten its most new members. And so we'd like to encourage all of you that when you get this, uh, to talk to your uh, to talk to your buddies, to talk to your friends that uh, and sit and ask them if they they've joined REA. And if they haven't, tell them to open up that packet and, and fill out that application and get it in. Because as we grow, we can provide better services. We can have a stronger voice, and we can do we can um, grow ourselves and develop ourselves and, and and represent you, our members, in a better way. Chris, do we know if we're ready to go yet? Well, it looked like we were rocking and rolling and we had them on. And then let's see, I'm not seeing a video. Uh, Dr. Wooten, are you able to communicate at the moment? Good uh, morning, can you see me? Can hear you, but not see you. And um, yes, just wanted to get that sorted out. We, we can her. see her when she speaks. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so doctor, if you don't mind, I'm gonna give a quick introduction, is that okay? Absolutely, thank you. You betcha, okay. So uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Wilma Wooten, who's the public health officer and director of public safety uh, health services in the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. She is both a medical doctor and also has a master's degree in public health. And I wanna give you just a little bit of background. Uh, last December, REA board members were asked to recommend people to be speakers at our monthly general meeting. And I suggested Dr. Wooten, when I was asked what she might speak about, I replied that it'd be good to get an update on vaccinations, which were about to become available back then in December. But I was mm -hmm. advised that we the first open spot for a speaker was this month in March. So I suggested we move her talk to January because by March, most people in our age group would be vaccinated already. But nobody seemed to think that could be possible. <laughs> well, here we are in March and about 24% of the San Diego County population 16 and over have received at least their first vaccination. About 13% uh, both vaccinations and the vast majority of that seems to be in our age group. So I guess the lesson here is don't underestimate uh, Dr. Wooten and her team at the county. Um, I think everybody on this call has had the experience of being a public servant like Dr. Wooten, but can you imagine having the responsibility of navigating our entire county through the most pressing health emergency in our lifetimes? Others in her position in other counties have quit under the pressure. Um, she has persevered to the betterment of all of us. In my estimation, she's the uh, most important public servant of the moment and shines a positive light on all of us in public service. 
Woo-hoo. She's got a tight set schedule today, as probably she always does, and can only be available until about 1140. So I'll stop talking and give uh, Dr. Wooten the floor and thank her so much for her time. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So thank you for those most kind words. Uh, I, I, as I always say, it's it, what we do in response to COVID-19 uh, has to be done uh, with the team, not only the county team, but uh, our partners uh, throughout the community. And um, I agree with you. I think that we have, we, the majority of we, um, have uh, done an outstanding job compared to other counties across the state. Uh, on Friday, we, uh, Supervisor um, and Chair Fletcher announced that we had vaccinated over one million individuals, and you'll see that in the dashboard that I'll show you shortly. So I will uh, go on and get started. In our next slide, what slide, what I want to share with you is some demographics regarding the COVID-19 cases. Now, uh, keep in mind that uh, we declared a public health emergency in San Diego on uh, February 14th, and then on March 11th, um, nationwide, uh, the WHO declared uh, a, um, a uh, national um, or worldwide uh, pandemic. And um, so we've been monitoring cases and we had to experience with the uh, expats that came in from Wuhan, China, uh, that were originally housed at um, uh, Miramar, and then a month later with uh, the uh, cruise ship uh, individuals that uh, came in from Hawaii that were positive. So we had a lot of experience before we had our first case on March 9th. So since then, um, we have had uh, cumulatively uh, 263,275 cases. Yesterday, we had 305 new cases that are included in that total. Now, um, and this is good news in terms of the numbers are going down, but we want to see them go down uh, and remain consistently in the two and one hundredths, uh, even lower. And as people, more people get vaccinated, I think we will see that. Now, on this slide, it shows you that of the total number of individuals, the majority, or 54%, are between the ages of 20 and 49 years of age. But when we look at our senior uh, citizen population, 30% are among those that are 50 years of age and older. The demographics by gender has remained consistent for the last nine months or so, about 52% being female and 48% being male. And then in terms of hospitalizations, we've had uh, approximately a 70% reduction in hospitalizations in the past 30 days. And yesterday, 19 hospitalizations uh, were admitted or individuals were admitted to the hospital. And of that number, six were uh, admitted to the ICU. There were no deaths yesterday reported, uh, which is the custom because uh, there is no activity going on in terms of um, investigating those uh, deaths over the weekend. So typically on Mondays we report zero deaths, but we know that we will have deaths reported today. And deaths make up uh, 1.3% of all cases. Now if you look at all cases, the median age is 36 and the age range is zero to 108 years of age. For those who have died, the median age is 78 and the age range is 10 to 106 years of age. Going to the next slide, this is a a historic depiction of the entire course of our pandemic. This is what we call an epi curve, and it documents cases by onset of illness, which is the most accurate way to do that. So uh, everyone's familiar with the huge wave wave that we had during the uh, holidays. And uh, fortunately, however, on January 25th, Uh, the state removed or lifted its regional stay-at-home order. Uh, And by that point, we had been vaccinating for approximately uh, uh, five weeks. 
So we were beginning to see cases uh, decrease. The last 14 days of any epi curve is the incubation period. And for this particular uh, uh, virus, the incubation period is 14 days. Now in the next slide, uh, this is a, a daily, uh, these are the daily cases reported, and as you'll see in the last uh, two weeks or so, particularly uh, since February 28th, uh, or actually even 27th, we have been uh, below, right at or below 500 uh, cases daily. So we want to continue to see that downward trend. In the next slide, uh, this shows our case rates as well as our testing positivity uh, percentage and then our health equity uh, metric. Uh, looking at the uh, very last row, that was last Tuesday when these metrics were reported and we will have new metrics after noon today. The results are embargoed until noon. Uh, as of uh, these results, we had an adjusted case rate of 10.8, and then our testing positivity was 4.2%, which would land us in the, the orange tier, and then our health equity testing positivity was 6%, which would land us in the red tier. However, the adjusted case rate um, has a, a, a more prominence and puts us in the purple tier. Again, this was as of last Tuesday. We anticipate, uh, hopefully today, that we will, uh, we anticipate we will be out of the uh, purple tier, but we will not know for sure until um, those uh, data are uh, released by the state, and that should happen at, about, at noon today. Now, in the next slide, this just shows the trend of the adjusted and the unadjusted case rate. Um, the, and how does an unadjusted case rate become an adjusted case rate? That depends on how much testing is done. If the uh, local uh, testing average is above the state testing average, then that helps to move our case rate to a lower level. If the local uh, testing uh, average is uh, below uh, the state's testing average, then it, we actually can even move up. Thankfully, we've been below the, or rather above the uh, state's uh, testing average uh, throughout this period. So we look forward to um, afternoon today, what uh, these results should bring. Now on the next slide, we want to jump to uh, talking about uh, vaccination eligibility. Uh, uh, phases. And currently on the left side of the slide in the green, uh, we started uh, phase 1A uh, in the middle of December, vaccinating healthcare personnel in the broad uh, brush. Any uh, staff associated particularly with acute care hospitals and other uh, categories of healthcare personnel from federally qualified health centers to uh, long-term care facilities, staffs, and residents. Uh, as well as behavioral um, um, health uh, uh, transitional or, or transitional institutions, uh, both those individuals that are staying in facilities as well as outpatient behavioral uh, facilities. So all of those were included in Phase 1A, and Phase 1A was approximately just over a million, 1.1 million. The same goes for, for Phase 1B, uh, another uh, over uh, a million individuals. And we, because of vaccine scarcity uh, and decreased supply, we started uh, all of these at different uh, phases. So we first started in phase 1B with individuals 75 and older. And we started that on January 18th. Then on the 24th of January, we, we opened it up to individuals that were 65 to 74. And then uh, on the 23rd of February, we opened it up to these uh, three uh, sectors, emergency services, Mary Lynn, can you please mute? 
whoever's got music going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank right. you. Education and child care and food and agriculture. And those uh, three groups alone are over a million individuals. And then on Monday, we are um, anticipating opening vaccinations up to individuals that are 16 to 64 with qualifying underlying medical conditions. Um, and people often ask, well, when will it be open to the general public? We anticipate as the vaccine supplies increase uh, that we um, – maybe sometime in uh, late April or early May, but uh, we don't know for sure. It really does depend on the vaccine supplies. And currently we have three vaccines that are available. Um, before we go to the next slide, uh, that includes Pfizer and Moderna, which are uh, mRNA vaccines uh, developed by the, uh, a specific protein. There's no live virus in the, those vaccines. And then the third uh, vaccine that uh, just became available um, last week uh, was or is uh, J&J &J or Janssen. And um, that is uh, one dose, whereas the first two are, are, are two dose series. So we are very excited about increasing the vaccination supply in our region. Now in the next slide, we just want to uh, share with you what our targets or our um, goal is. Uh, we have 3.4, approximately 3.4 million individuals in San Diego County. And uh, Pfizer vaccine is FDA approved for 16 years and older, while all other vaccines are 18 years of age and older. So we looked at the population out of our uh, 3.4 uh, million uh, population in San Diego. Uh, individuals 16 and older represent about 2.7 uh, million uh, San Diego residents. So our goal uh, is to vaccinate 70% of that total, and that gives us almost 1.9 million individuals. Now, if you, I'll show you shortly, we've vaccinated over 1 million already, so uh, we are more than halfway there, but we have to uh, manage this with the decreased supply of vaccines, and I'm sure many of you have heard about some of the uh, vaccination sites being closed. So, again, it is, uh, that's related to uh, manufacturing uh, production, and part of that time was related to the weather on the East Coast about three weeks ago. So going to the next slide, this is the dashboard I spoke of earlier. And if you look right in the middle, we have received 1.15 million uh, doses of vaccine into our region, into the county of San Diego. And of that number, uh, Almost 1.1 million individuals have uh, received vaccines, and uh, there's an additional almost 20,000 that also have been vaccinated, but the documentation has not be yet been entered into our SDR. And that's because we have uh, paramedics and EMTs going out into the communities and the rural areas, and uh, they are documenting their uh, activities um, on hard copies, and we are in the process of getting them signed up electronically uh, through the state. Uh, but that process is uh, being uh, run through the state. And then we have 70,000 uh, uh, doses that are on hand for the next seven days. So that is the total uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, those three numbers uh, represent the one point, almost 1 1.2 uh, doses that have been received to our region. All in all, if you look to the left side of the uh, slide, we have had uh, almost 650,000 individuals or 24% of individuals that have uh, been uh, received one vaccine, and 340, almost 342,000, or almost 13 percent, that are fully vaccinated. So we feel that this is indeed a uh, triumph for our region. The other graphics, uh, we, at the County of San Diego in public health, 
We like to look at data through five lenses, age, gender, geography, race and ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Uh, we have four of those here. Age on the far left in the middle is gender. Uh, then at the bottom right is race and ethnicity. And then we have geography in the upper uh, right. Going to the next uh, couple of slides, what I want to share with you is where uh, are our vaccination sites uh, located. And uh, on this slide, it shows the various ecosystems. Uh, we can remove the top info. The various uh, ecosystems that um, where our vaccination sites are located. So at the top of the run uh, is uh, county hosted vaccine uh, events or sites. Then we have our super stations, like the one at Petco Park run by UCSD. And then we have one at Del Mar uh, run by Scripps. Those are just uh, a couple of examples. And then uh, we have mobile vaccination teams. Uh, these are uh, coordinated and with our EMT and paramedic vaccinators. Uh, obviously, uh, hospitals and our clinics uh, have vaccines to vaccinate their patient populations. And then we have a city, uh, the City of San Diego partnership, uh, where they are vaccinating um, from the homeless populations. Um, and other uh, populations. And then lastly, the last two populations, military and veterans, we do not get the numbers from military and the Veterans Administration, but we just wanted to show that this is another location uh, or another ecosystem that is vaccinating their populations. And lastly, pharmacies, we have three different buckets for pharmacies, and uh, that includes um, Walgreens and CVS, uh, through a partnership with CDC, are vaccinating our long-term care facilities in SNFs. Then CDC also developed another partnership with uh, commercial pharmacies that began on February 12th. And our Vons, our Rite Aids, uh, CVS, Walgreens, individuals can get vaccinated there. And then uh, the county, uh, forged relationships and developed a memorandum of uh, agreements uh, with some of our local pharmacies, including those that are uh, privately owned as opposed to the large commercial uh, pharmacies. But we do have some of those that are providers under the county. If we go to the next slide, it shows the total number of the various uh, sites. At, through the end of February, uh, we had 12 uh, county hosted vaccine uh, sites. We had uh, six super stations. Then our county uh, hospital partnership vaccination events, five sites. And then we have a, a program in Northern County called Operation Collaboration Vaccination Events. And these are uh, coordinated by our, again, EMTs and uh, paramedics. They go into rural areas, uh, farm uh, workers. They also vaccinate individuals that are in uh, um, senior uh, high rises, going to those vulnerable and frail pro populations that uh, do not uh, have the capability to go to a, a community-based testing site. And then, as I stated earlier, we have the mobile vaccination teams, and these are uh, uh, sites that are scheduled throughout any given week. So we have a large capacity for vaccinations in San Diego, about 33,000 uh, average vaccinations per day. But due to the vaccine um, decreased supply, we have been vaccinating through the end of February about 14,000 uh, average vaccines, vaccinations rather per day. Now let's go uh, to the next slide we wanted to show you. Uh, we talked about the pharmacies uh, that are vaccinating and those round red dots are pharmacies, but also the triangles are our um, community-based pods and the star. Uh, the stars are our super stations and they are placed throughout the community and we have tried to locate them in areas our uh, what we call our health equity areas. 
And then we have some on the coastal uh, uh, as well, as well, uh, probably the area that uh, we are continuing to focus on now is uh, the rural areas. Uh, we are working with our tribal nations to stand up a vaccination site for those tribal members that are not eligible to be vaccinated through the Indian Health Services uh, Clinic. And uh, we are continuing uh, in southern part of the county. We have a uh, program that helps to uh, go into the community and help those seniors that are not IT uh, sa savvy or smartphone savvy. Uh, to help sign them up uh, for their vaccinations by calling 211 and helping them navigate that system. We also have uh, contracts with about 11 different partners uh, in the community to help uh, enroll seniors and vulnerable populations um, for their vaccine. Now, this slide, I wanted to show this to you uh, because when it comes to protecting our most vulnerable adults, these are our uh, residents that are in long-term care facilities and skilled nursing facilities. So in San Diego, we have 1,347 uh, long-term care facilities and SNFs, which are skilled nursing facilities. There's about uh, 1,261 uh, long-term care facilities and 86 SNFs. 100% uh, of the SNFs uh, have been uh, vaccinated for first and second doses. Now, this is primarily done through the uh, federal partnership, CDC with CVS and Walgreens. And because we have so many long-term care facilities, we also uh, had our paramedics and EMTs also support this process. 93% of our long-term care facilities have received their first dose, and uh, uh, we are now working on getting them vaccinated for uh, that second dose. So finally, I just want to uh, end as I uh, try to end all of my presentations. Even with the vaccinations, we want individuals to continue to practice the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we started back in March of last year. And the three W's, according to CDC, is wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear your mask. And we encourage everyone, if they become ill with COVID-19 or symptoms that they might think would be COVID-19, to isolate themselves, call their doctor, uh, make arrangements for getting uh, uh, tested for COVID-19. And when it is your turn in general, when you are not sick, we want people to get vaccinated. So with that, I will uh, end, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wooden. Um, now, do you have time for a few questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, Jim and Chris, will you help me uh, recognize people that have questions? I, I have one to get us started. Dr. Wooten, you said the, the yes. March 15th date uh, was that a hard date for opening up to the next category or was that a, a projected date? No, that's a hard date. Uh, next Monday, we will open up to individuals 16 to 64 years of age that are at that are high risk, that have underlying medical conditions. And we have a list of those conditions on our website. They're based on um, uh, recommendations by the CDC as well as our California Department of Public Health. How, how does one with a condition demonstrate that? What, what's the process for getting authorization? Well, you know, that's a question that is being debated at the state. Uh, we are certainly not trying to be the uh, uh, underlying uh, medical condition police. When you sign up, particularly if people sign up in my turn, it asks you if you have an underlying uh, medical uh, condition and clicking that. Um, maybe even taking a screenshot of that. And that is a form of attestation that you have an underlying medical condition. Um, other documents uh, could be uh, documents from your medical provider. And actually, if people get vaccinated with their medical providers, those who have vaccines, it's a no-brainer uh, and a no-issue because your uh, health care provider knows what your conditions are through your uh, medical records. 
we are not trying to make this difficult. So uh, we uh, definitely want people to respect the honor system and sign up accordingly. Great. All right. Other questions? Dick, yes. Yeah, Dick, we have a we have a question in the chat, and this is from Stacy Lamedico. She says, "Thank you for the incredible leadership. Clearly, Hi, you Stacey. and your team are <laughs> are a leader in the state in the proactive response. Uh, the region had uh oh, sorry, something else came up here and jumped in front of me here." Uh, the region had another unprecedented health crisis in 2017 with Hep A. What role did yeah. that crisis play in being prepared for this pandemic response? Well, thank you for that question, uh, Stacey. And I just want to acknowledge for everyone else on the call, uh, we enjoyed a great relationship with the city of San Diego, uh, working closely with Stacey uh, to uh, respond to our hepatitis A outbreak. I think one of the most important things, Stacy, was uh, reaching those hard to reach populations. So uh, continuing to utilize our foot teams uh, to take vaccinations and particularly the Johnson Johnson, even the, the Moderna is a, a good vaccination, but a one dose vaccination is even better because we would only have to go look for those populations once. Also, leveraging our Live Well San Diego partnerships was another uh, important uh, lesson learned from hepatitis A. Thank, Thank you, you for that for that question. Yes. Other Let's questions? See anybody else? Uh, yep, uh, we got another one in the chat. Uh, do you know when or what will trigger our ability to again visit persons in skilled nursing facilities? I think once all of the skilled nursing facilities are uh, vaccinated and uh, facilities develop a plan for new admissions or new staff, and then once our herd immunity uh, is achieved, I think that will uh, help open up things again. But again, this is a our most vulnerable, these are our most vulnerable populations. Of all of our deaths, uh, deaths in the uh, congregate care facilities represented uh, over 30% of all, of all deaths. So this is very important and we understand uh, the need for our seniors to have connection to their family members. And those factors that I mentioned uh, will need to be in place to open it up broadly again. But I, I would imagine, however, that uh, allowing people to visit will, you will be asking, are you, have you been vaccinated? Have you been tested in the past uh, three days? All of those uh, different types of uh, measures uh, will most likely be taken and we will uh, are awaiting guidance from the CDC and the state on what that would look like. Chris, you can, okay. why don't you continue with the chat? Questions. Yeah, okay, next question in the chat. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, what can, should we say to friends and others who seem to think that masks and distancing isn't important? <laughs> Boy, there's a question. <laughs> yeah, there is. I, I think there are several national situations that we can point to where entire families were uh, ravaged by this disease. Uh, there's the uh, situation of a family, and I don't re remember exactly, but somewhere in um, on the East Coast or even in the South, where uh, members were members of a church uh, in a choir, and several members uh, contracted the illness and, and died. And we have uh, stories of children whose uh, both parents contracted the illness and died. Uh, if you've listened to Dr. Fauci, uh, one mask, uh, and it depends on, on the type of mask. If you have a one single layer mask, that's uh, about 50% effectiveness. It really is important to have either two or three layers. And now we're seeing some people wear two masks, particularly if one is a single layer and you put another one over that so you have the uh, uh, the fitting uh, around the face. So just look at the number of deaths uh, that we've achieved here in San Diego or even across the nation. Uh, masks help decrease uh, transmission when you are talking or singing. Uh, 
the masks help to prevent droplets from being spread from one person to another. Dr. Wooten, thank you so much. Your secretary is telling me she's giving you the hook for another call. So thank you so very much for taking the time to speak with us all today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Happy to come back to talk to you at any time. Thank you, Dr. Wooten. We really appreciate all right. it. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Chris, I want to thank you for arranging Dr. Wooten today and for helping to host us. And Jim, thank you again for, as always, for setting up our Zoom and hosting our Zoom. I would like to thank all of the members. I wish we had more time for questions, but maybe we'll get her back again sometime. And uh, thank you all for participating. Remember our recruitment effort in this June and July and um, uh, help us add to our members. So I uh, really appreciate everybody's participation. And, and with that, we'll, we'll adjourn the meeting. If anybody wants to hang around and socialize, you're welcome to for a little bit. Um,